Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. I hope you've had an enjoyable Sunday thus far. Welcome to you all uh, to the headquarters of the Arboricultural Association here in Stonehouse in the UK. Hello, Pinky in Bangladesh. Um, my name's John Parker, Technical Director at the Association, and I will be your host for this evening. Please say hello in the chat. Lots of you already are. Uh, let us know where you're watching from, but please select all panellists and attendees when you do so. If you've got any questions, then please enter your question using the Q&A button, uh, and we will answer as many as we can at the end. We'll be going for about an hour or so tonight, I think. This is our third and final webinar of the special ARB Show 2021 series, where there's still lots of ARB Show content for you to explore using the link, which I'm sure Steve will put in the chat at some point this evening. Uh, and if you're already thirsty for more webinars, then please sign up right away without delay for this week's Wednesday webinar, which is all about urban trees and smart cities. It's free to join, six o'clock UK time this Wednesday. It's gonna be a really interesting one. But this evening, we're delighted to be joined by John Stokes of the Tree Council. Now the Tree Council are currently running a really great project all about hedgerows to highlight just how important these often unappreciated features are to the whole natural world. It's a brilliant initiative, a very interesting topic, and I'm really pleased to invite John Stokes to the virtual Arb Show stage. John, it's over to you. Thank you, John. Um, and I'm going to just make sure I share the share this. So good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you, John, for introducing me. Um, and uh, we're delighted to be here at this virtual Arb Show this, this evening. So as John said, I'm John Stokes from the Tree Council. I'm Director of uh, Tree Science and Research. And the Tree Council is an organisation that was set up to, um, uh, to be the champion of non-woodland trees. We were set up back in the uh, 80s as a sort of uh, quango that was there to develop um, and to develop policy and practice for non-woodland trees. Um, and we're now, now a charity and our work is basically broken up into these four key threads. Um, the four threads are community action and we have lots of tree wardens around the country who are involved in the, the care and protection of their trees at local levels. We have a young learning um, thread of work, which is about involving uh, schools and community uh, people with their, their schools um, and developing young tree champions. Uh, we have a, a, a whole thread of work, which is uh, on practical science and research, which is looking at how we, how we can uh, work with government and academics to deliver uh, good science uh, and make it easy for people to understand. And we have a whole uh, thread of work, which is about partnership power, working with our members, because the Tree Council doesn't have members of the public as members, it has organisations. Um, and it's working with our charity partners to try and uh, advocate for all those non-woodland trees around the country. I also happen to be chair of Hedgelink. Um, uh, Hedgelink used to be the, the DEFRA panel. It's now the expert group on hedges. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is, is cut from work that's gone on over the last 20 years from Hedgelink, um, which is this expert panel of some of the some really, really interested people, um, interesting people in hedges. Um, and if you want more information, you can have a look at the uh, Hedgelink website, which will tell you an awful lot about hedgerows. But we'll come back to that as we go through this evening. So hedges, where do we start? Well, hedges have been in the landscape. They're probably one of the oldest landscape features around. And this is Zena in Cornwall. Um, and this field system in Zena is said to be about 7,000 years old. They're Cornish hedges, which mean that they're hedges with walls or stone built into the structure, which is how we've, we know they've been there for such a long time. But they've still got a, an organic, a tree component in this structure, which is uh, that there's a bank um, with stones either side and through the middle of the bank comes the hedge and uh, these really really ancient features of our landscape have been there for such a long time and we we've we've had hedges and hedge management for most of that period for the for the full 7,000 years that we've been exploring and of course our our relationship with hedges comes in many forms when we were when we were living in houses like this we had uh, dry hedges, we had hedges that created fields, we had dead, deadwood hedges. We also had hedges that were live, that were starting to, to shape the countryside. Um, and then the Romans arrived and they introduced the garden. Uh, and in the garden, there were hedges that were 
decorative and ornamental so that we used to have hedges both in agricultural settings but also in domestic settings and the history of the landscape is really written in the hedges um, we have a very very long tradition of the way we've managed our countryside and it is there in the hedges for us all to see and if you look at look at this um, this field system here there are all sorts of things that you can tell about the history of the landscape oops, sorry, uh, um, uh, which you can tell about the history of the landscape from the nature of the fields from the way the fields are, are shaped from the shapes of the fields from the irregularity of some fields to these rectilinear ones here which are which are probably bronze age to the way hedges have been removed from the fields um, by later agricultural development it's all there all of our history written in those hedges and even uh, when we get into towns and cities we often have hedges left as relics in the structure old countryside hedges that have been left growing at the bottom of people's gardens because the um, the houses were built in the fields the hedge was retained as the boundary and there is an ancient hedgerow in a in a garden setting that people probably never think about so hedges are there as an important part of the landscape um, and we just don't always think about them they're also brilliant for biodiversity they, they help with they're going to help with climate emergency uh, uh, slowing down flood water uh, reducing water runoff trapping chemicals they help our cities to breathe by having um, absorbing pollutants by being at low level so a lot of the trapping effect is where people are um, it's catching those pollutants from the cars from the vehicles and stopping them from getting to people they're important as part of our green economy and they're really important as part of well-being in our towns and cities and as part of our culture and heritage they are one of the most complicated and and least valued treescapes that we've got and i think hedges are probably britain's largest nature reserve uh, the the data suggests that 11 percent of the priority species the biodiversity action plan species uh, live in our hedges 88 percent of those uh, of those 130 species are widespread but many are rapidly declining and many of them depend upon the hedgerow tree that that third dimension, the big tall trees growing in the hedge. Uh, and for example, if you're into, into birds, 21 of Britain's priority birds uh, live in a hedge. Of, the, of that, 13 are, uh, hedgerows there are their primary habitat. So hedges are really, really valuable things for biodiversity. And uh, we went on a conference, um, a colleague of mine called Rob Walton and I went uh, traveling up to, to Suffolk and we started to talk about this and Rob decided that what he would do is, is assess the number of species that he could find in a hedge that was close to him. And uh, he, it, was, it was a Devon hedge, there was nothing particularly special, it was a laneside hedge. But over one year, uh, Rob went out and had a look at how many species he could find in that 90 metre long stretch of um, Devon laneside hedge. And the numbers were quite stunning. He found 2,060 species that he could recognize in that 90 meter stretch of hedge. And probably another uh, 900 or so species that he couldn't, tiny little wasps that they couldn't put names to. So, so we think that 90 meters may have supported nearly 3,000 species, which is an astonishing number for a very average little bit of hedge in Devon. And to put that into perspective, it, it, it was 17% of the, the um, national population of flies that we have. It was 17% of the moths and butterflies uh, in Britain were in this one little stretch of hedge and so on, as you can see. So these hedges are not only biologically important, but they are a really, really vital part of the connectivity across the landscape. And there is that hedge in context. Uh, it is part of that nature recovery network that people are talking about now. It is part of, of the way that the landscape can be used by wildlife and through which the, the wildlife can move if it's given the opportunity. And there's lots of policy work that's going on now about delivering and developing these nature recovery networks. But the hedge can be and can deliver a really important part of that connectivity. 
Now, the Tree Council obviously has a particular interest in the trees in the hedge. And unfortunately, the trees in the hedges are not doing quite so well as the hedges themselves. Uh, there's an estimate that uh, government hedges, sorry, government figures, the last ones of which, which were back in 2000, showed that there was probably about 1.67 million hedgerow trees. Uh, there's a very technical definition of what is a hedgerow tree, but there's about 1.67 million hedgerow trees. And if you look at this graph, you can see this is the age distribution of that graph. So this, of those trees. So this blue line represents the actual age class distribution. Um, with almost 60, uh, sorry, for over 50% of the population being over 60 years old and nearly 30% of the population being over 100 years old. Only 1.6% of the population is under five years old. And there is no population of anything um, on the planet that can survive with no new recruitment to it. And so the hedge tree population should look something like this with over 45% of the trees in that young class. So there is a huge gap between what there actually is and what there needs to be if we're to have a, uh, a new population of hedge trees. And then we got ash dieback, which, which impacted um, ash trees, which is the commonest hedgerow tree. And there is an estimate uh, from government statistics that there's 61,000 miles of hedges that is primarily dominated by ash. If you just thought that there were about uh, one tree every five meters, just to calculate, because we do not know for a, for a certainty, that would mean that there was probably nearly 20 million ash trees that we're going to lose, uh, or we might lose, or some proportion of that population might be lost to ash dieback. And even before ash dieback, we had to, to plant 30,000 new hedgerow trees a year. So if you throw in ash dieback, we have to plant 30, 40, 50, 60,000 new hedgerow trees every year if we are to keep our hedgerow tree population healthy. And if we want a landscape that looks as it does at the moment, we need to be doing that. Hedges themselves over, um, uh, over the last 50 years, uh, we, we now estimate there's about 500,000 kilometres of, oops, there's a, there's a naught missing, sorry. That should be 500,000 kilometers of hedge um, across England. Of that, 402,000 kilometers is still in reasonable management, but there's 145,000 kilometers that has started to, um, to uh, become lines of trees and uh, uh, relic hedges and so on. Which means that roughly since the war, we've lost half of our hedges uh, either to agricultural changes that happened in, in the 70s and 80s, or from this transition of the hedge into something that's more of a, a relic line of trees. So to get our, our hedgerows into a good heart, they've got, we need more of them, um, and they need to be better managed. So what does better management look like? Well, hedges were carved out of woodlands in many cases historically, not all cases because Obviously, many uh, hedges were then created in the Enclosure Act. But there were a lot of hedges that were carved out of woodland. The woodland was left, um, I'm sorry, the, the fields were managed, strips of woodland were left, they became hedges. Um, and the techniques that we used to manage those hedges were, were basically the same ones that we used to manage the woods. We coppiced them, we pollarded the trees. But in hedges, what that looks like is something like this, a coppiced hedgerow, something that you don't see very often these days um, because we're not used to that, that, that forestry style, that woodland management style approach to coppicing our hedges uh, because we wanted them there because we had stock over the side. We wanted some, uh, some structure of a hedge there all the time. And with the rise of fox hunting, which led to changes in the way the countryside was managed, the hedges became uh, more managed, they became more shaped, you had stock that you had to manage, and a whole range of other skills started to de be developed. It wasn't just coppicing and pollarding. We started to get into this, um, uh, this craft of hedge laying, um, and hedge laying across the country became very different, um, suited to local circumstances, suited to local needs, whether you had cows or whether you had sheep or arable, um, whether you were in the north or the south, 
And wherever you are, where in the country, there was a style of hedge lane that was suitable to your, your purposes. And even the equipment that they used varied because the hedge varied, so the tools varied um, around the country. And what that created was this skill of hedge laying, um, which is uh, the, the, the guy teaching there on the top right is called Nigel Adams, who's who I'll refer to in a minute. Um, but Nigel and the hedge layers then, uh, sorry, or the hedge layers and, and now hedge layers like Nigel um, learned the skill, passed on the skill, passed on those traditions that were there for the way a hedgerow was managed. Um, and they created all of these different styles of hedges. Uh, and here are but two of them, the Nottinghamshire style hedge and the Midland Bullock hedge. Um, you might think to yourself, they didn't look, look like real hedges, but they were real hedges. Um, they were just bonsai real hedges. Um, one of the most impressive things I've seen in many, many years was the National Hedge Laying Society produced all of the different hedgerow styles in little miniature bonsai hedges to demonstrate uh, the different styles for shows and exhibitions. Remarkable thing to show, putting those traditional skills um, on something bonsai. But if you think about it, a hedge really is a bonsai. It is uh, lots of trees and shrubs that have been managed, shaped, and cut to form uh, a landscape that is meeting the agricultural needs of the farmers. And that skill of, of, of management has gone on for centuries in the way the landscape looks and in the way the landscape has been used. But then what happened was the um, First and Second World War came along and lots of the people with those skills uh, went off to, to fight the wars. Some of them didn't come back, many of them didn't come back. There was a need to develop new techniques. And so they started to invent machinery that would provide the ability to do hedge management without necessarily all of the people that they had to do the work. Um, and that is possibly one of the most, <laughs> just, this is one of Nigel's pictures. It is, it is one of the most beautiful Heath Robinson st style machines that I've ever seen. Uh, and obviously did what they were trying to do, shape the hedge at that time. Obviously, as we've come through the last 50 years, uh, hedgerow machinery has changed, it's become more sophisticated, and uh, it has given the capacity to do hedge management in different ways. That can be good. There are many very, very skilled operators who can use flails very, very well, but the, equally there is the opportunity to not do it so well. And the future of hedges is dependent upon making sure that everybody who is managing hedgerows understands what they're trying to do, understands the skills that are required, has the right training and information to make good judgments about how the hedge should be managed. And that might require um, different sorts of machinery going forward. It might require different ways of doing the job. Um, circular saws, for example, might become, uh, might become a different way of managing a hedge, particularly at a different point in its life, different point in its cycle. So the combination of the right techniques, the right tools, and the right machines is going to be um, critical to the way our hedgerow and our landscapes look. Because just because we have machines, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're using them better. And <laughs> I mean, uh, it sounds almost apocryphal, but we were sent this um, we were sent this picture by the Irish Hedge Laying Association as as a, an example of what should not be done. Um, I, every time I see it, I wonder how on earth uh, they got above the wires. Um, it is absolutely not what you do with a machine to manage a hedge. But it is part of that, that, that thought process that just because you have a machine, it doesn't mean you should use it in all circumstances. It's getting it right that matters going forward because every tree tells a story of how it was managed. Every one of those trees and shrubs um, in that hedge will tell you how it's been managed over time. And this photograph is this specimen back here. Um, uh, and we counted the rings just to demonstrate what was happening. And in this central core, which is, you know, maybe inch, inch and a half across, uh, there were, um, 
uh, the tree started, or the, he the hawthorn started in 1869. And in that, it's nearly a hundred years of growth in just an inch um, of, of diameter because it was managed heavily. It was, it was kept, kept bonsai as a, as a hedgerow shrub. Then 1940, um, the hedge, the, the hawthorn suddenly starts to grow, gets bigger, the rings get taller. And that's what happened because the farmer on that particular estate went off to war, didn't come back. So the hedges stopped being managed. Um, <clears throat> and therefore the tree grew rapidly because it's not taking uh, the management that it had previously. So every bit of that tree's history and its management is written in its rings. And therefore the management of the hedge is critical. So over the years, we've done all sorts of experiments as Hedgelink with DEFRA on different ways of managing hedges to try and work out what good looks like. Um, and this is your standard hedgerow cut. Uh, where you trim it back to the same point every year. This is a, a, a more relaxed system where you let it grow out um, and so on across this hedge. We looked at the timing of cutting autumn versus winter. We looked at the frequency of cutting, whether it was one, two or three years. <clears throat> we looked at the intensity. This is called incremental growth, where you let the, the, the hedge breathe a bit every time you cut it, you give it an extra 10 centimetres. And we looked at different ways of of managing them from traditional hedge laying through a slightly more relaxed style of conservation hedging, which is where you don't involve quite so much highly technical skills, even up to something we call wildlife hedging, where we just push them over with a machine. And what, what we discovered um, and what is now scientifically there in the literature is that if you want to maximize your biodiversity, you cut your hedges at least every two years and ideally every three. But if you're going to cut them every two years, you need to let them breathe a bit. They need to get slightly bigger each year. But what that will do is that will increase your berry production. It will increase your um, fruit, flower production. Uh, all of that will be good for the wildlife and will increase the opportunities for species to live in the landscape. And the research showed that there was really strong evidence for, for benefits for wildlife of reducing the frequency of cutting so every three years, but if you had to cut on a more regular basis to just do this incremental, just give it an extra 10 centimeters, let it grow out, let it grow out, let it grow a little bit bigger. And that massively increased the benefits to all of the, um, the values that, that people place upon hedges. And all of this is written up if you want to have a look, uh, and I think Steve's gonna post in the chat the link to this. Uh, all of this is written up in the CEH uh, information so you can see the science and you can see what it means. We looked also at the methods for the costs of the different um, methods. And obviously the less, uh, the, the more you push it over, you push it over rather than managing it more comprehensively by hedge laying, the cheaper it is. Uh, but any form of management and keeping it managed properly didn't seem to matter whether it was coppiced or, sorry, whether it was, um, uh, whether it was done on the conservation style or whether it was done on the hedge lay. It just needed that rejuvenation and that management uh, to, to maximize the opportunities. So the next part of the equation is you've got a hedge. So how do you determine what is the right management for that hedge? And again, on the Hedgelink website, you will see Nigel did a, a Nigel Adams I've referred to already, did, did a fantastic piece of work of describing these 10 life stages of a hedge. Uh, uh, of a hedge. And the 10 life stages of a hedge is how you can look at it and decide whether that's a four or a five or an eight or a nine. And from that, what you would do with it. People's Trust for Endangered Species um, then took that data and Megan from People's Trust for Endangered Species produces lovely um, graphic, which beautifully articulates um, uh, Nigel's cycle. Um, and tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but this week, uh, there is a launch by PTS of, of an app that gives you the capacity to um, uh, to look at your hedge and do some some survey, which will lead you to an uh, an identification of the stage of your hedge and therefore your management procedures. And again, Steve will post that in the chat. But what that means is that you can now look at a hedge, and you can see whether it's a class one hedge or a class two hedge or a class eight hedge or a class ten hedge. And then there is some actions that you can that you can undertake 
to do something about it. So here's a, a class one hedge, heavily over trimmed, lots of gaps, maybe invaded by elder. So what do you do? Well, you might coppice it or you might replant it and fill in the gaps. Um, that might be your solution for a class one. In a class five, which is a, a hedge in good state, um, you might trim in, it in a two or a three year um, rotation. You might raise your cu cutting heights just so that you let it breathe a bit, it gives it that opportunity to develop more flowers and fruit. And that's because many of these rosaceous species that are the, the prime uh, parts of a hedge flower on second and third year wood. So if you give it the chance, to breathe a bit you will just get more flowers <laughs> and there's a, a class he a nine hedge what might you do with this well you might lay it um, you might reduce it by height and use a circular saw to reshape it <coughs> or you might coppice it all of these options exist and if you go to the hedge link uh, stuff you can see Nigel's um, uh, system there and then you can start to be able to make judgments about how you manage your hedge successfully. But we also started to produce some, some general points on behalf of HedgeLink about how, <coughs> excuse me, about how a hedge might be managed. <coughs> so some basic rules. Don't cut your hedge too often or too tight. Uh, as we've said, let it have a, a two or a three year cutting cycle. You need to cut it at the right time of year. If you've, if you've um, manage your hedge to allow that flower and fruit, then don't cut it in September when you will take off all the, the flowers and fruit that you've just, that you've, you've created over those two or three years of not managing it. So cut it in winter if you can. Um, now we know getting on to cut in winter can be really difficult because of wet fields, but if you can't cut in winter, let the hedge breathe, give it that extra space, give it 10 centimeters on the cutting point from last two or three years ago because that will increase the possibilities for, for other flowers. Encourage native trees and shrubs. Um, diverse uh, new plantings, diverse introductions into hedges is all to the good. Um, what we really don't want is a situation where something got in an affected hawthorn, because if you have a monoculture of hawthorn hedges across the country and something got in and killed the hawthorns, then that would be tragic. So we need some diversity in our hedgerow structure. We need to think about what the nature and mixture of those hedges are, just to mix it up a bit and give that opportunity for other species to be there as part of that resilience. If you're in urban areas, and particularly when you're planting hedges, um, you need to think about the right size trees and things that you're gonna plant, trees and shrubs that you're gonna plant so that you, you plant the right size. And don't create yourself situations which come into conflict with your neighbours by planting species that will be grow too tall or are the wrong species for the space. That's basic tree knowledge. That's about planting the right size for your space. To keep it thick and dense, we want to have uh, hedges that have um, that structural meshing together so that the birds can live in it, so that there are opportunities for for species to live in them. And, and species matters, certainly in urban areas, if you're planting, you might want to think about what you're planting your hedge of, but that's true of any hedge across the country. Uh, and managing it properly, as, as we've seen with Nigel, can massively increase that opportunity for keeping your hedge thick and dense. We have a particular, as I said, we have a particular interest in hedge trees. So make sure that we've planted uh, new hedge trees into the landscape. Um, because if we don't, 30,000 minimum we need to be putting into the landscape every year. Um, that's a huge task. So how do you plant hedges into the structure of your hedges? I should, sorry, hedge trees into the structure of your hedges. I should come back to that in a minute. And um, link your hedges up, fill the gaps, create, create situations where you fill the gap and you don't have uh, opportunity well you know a wasted space like this fence um, which became the hedge that's there on the left you know fill those spaces up fill those opportunities up to put new hedges because they can only be good if you wherever you plant them in the countryside in the towns or the cities now the climate change committee <coughs> said that uh, we need to 
to, to get to carbon neutral, we need to plant or increase our hedges by 40%. Um, and if you think there are 500,000 kilometers of hedge, then in England alone, that is 200,000, uh, sorry, um, do the math. Uh, across the country, we need to plant 200,000 kilometers of new hedgerow, um, or we need to let our hedgerow get wider, um, whether it be more length or greater width. All of that increases the opportunity for the hedge to take up carbon. One of the problems we have is that you get to industrial scale hedge, hedge planting that always involves tubes, and we then don't go back and manage those tubes properly. So Tree Council are on a, uh, on a push at the moment to make sure that we, we find ways to in, uh, put new um, or, or less plastic into the environment by finding different um, structures that we can use to, to plant in. Um, but if you're planting them and you've plastic, then you need to go back and remove it. And that doesn't happen at the moment. If we were to plant 200,000 kilometers of new hedge, if that was our target over the next 30 years, at current grant rates, that's about two billion pounds worth of, of new hedge planting that has to take place. Two billion pounds worth of hedge planting is, is an awful lot of hedges. Um, ironically, it only takes us back to the position we were in in about 1970, that will, will put the hedges back that were lost as a result of agricultural change. But two billion pounds has to be done, has to be spent well and has to be done properly. And so there is an awful lot of work that we collectively need to be doing to make sure that we're planting and looking after those hedges that we're planting in the way that meets that climate change um, net zero aspiration. It's a massive task and that's, that's separate from all of the 30,000 hectares of woodland that needs to be planted across the country. So tree planting over the next, tree and hedge planting over the next 20 or 30 years is going to become um, everybody's uh, major focus. But it shouldn't just be planting. You can establish hedges by letting them seed. You can, you know, let hedges grow naturally if you can take your time. Um, birds will perch on the fence and it will happen. It's about how you manage the landscape. It's about how you manage the countryside to ensure that these things happen, whether they're planted or whether they're established from some other means. And we need to really think hard about how we're going to establish this countryside because once we've planted them, we really don't want to just be chopping them back and chopping them back and getting them into these clipped boxes because that defeats the whole point. We need to let them spread, so we need to give them space and give them the opportunity to develop properly into those biodiverse assets that they can become. And we need to think about how we establish the hedgerow trees. The hedgerow trees are a really complicated part of the system um, because you want them at a reasonable spacing, you want them to not shade out the hedge, you want them to develop that, that uh, complete canopy that they require. And getting that mixture of the hedge tree and the hedge together is, is exciting, it's challenging. Um, and we haven't been very good at it over the years. Well, not everybody, some people have. And, and this is Ernest, uh, he's one of our tree wardens up in Norfolk and these are his hedgerow trees. Um, he's been planting hedgerow trees longer than he's been a tree warden. He's been planting them for 40 years in his parish, which is near Buckingham in, in um, in, Nor uh, in Norfolk. And uh, every tree that is, you can see on this aerial satellite picture was planted by Ernest. He's planted all of them over the years. So you can change landscapes by planting hedgerow trees if you do it right, if you do it properly. And to try and explore that, um, DEFRA have a, a program going on that we're managing called Shared Outcomes. Um, one of the, this is a two and a half million pound research trial that's going on at the moment. And one of the five research trials that's going on is on trees in the farm landscape. <clears throat> We're experimenting with all sorts of ways to try and get new field trees, new hedgerow trees. Uh, we're looking at bays and enclosures. We're looking at fence strip, field corners, new hedgerow trees, infill planting. 
We're even experimenting with, with circular things like this, which is about planting a hedge around a tree to try and protect it from the, from the, um, uh, protect the tree from the stock when they're allowed back into the fields. We're trying to experiment with all sorts of new ways of getting fields back into the, sorry, getting trees back into the farmed landscape. Um, and we're also experimenting with different forms of management, different ways of, of managing the hedge to see if we can get the hedgerow trees to come through. Because they will, if they're given the opportunity, if they're marked, if they're protected when they're young, if you can work out how to protect that tree and allow it to grow through and become uh, that next generation of hedgerow trees, you don't need to plant it. You just need to make sure you pick the right ones, manage them and look after them. So that exp those experiments are going on. We're into the first season of that. Uh, results from those trials we will be shared in about two years. Um, but in the interim, we need everybody to be going out and doing what they think to be the right thing for their hedges. And to try and help with that, there's, there's a program that John referred to at the beginning that's managed by a colleague of mine, Louise, who I think is on the call this evening. Um, and this is called Close the Gap. This is 1.8 million pounds of uh, heritage lottery funding that's been um, given uh, with DEFRA through this thing called the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. And in this project, we have a whole group of partners, FWAG, People's Trust for Endangered Species, More Trees, University of Reading, uh, and others who are looking at the way that we can promote hedges. <clears throat> and it's about planting then gapping them up. It's about developing a better knowledge base. So Reading University are currently researching all the literature that exists on hedges so that we can put together um, uh, a repository for everybody to know what the what good looks like. Um, we're developing um, new resources to help um, people to, to grow their own trees, to, to think about um, establishing small community hedges and, and um, community tree nurseries that help the establishment of those hedges. And we're trying to engage people with our hedgerow heritage. So that campaign uh, was launched uh, earlier this year. We had the first National Hedgerow Week back at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, and that will roll out every year, promoting the value that hedges have. Uh, and we will be planting another 32 miles of hedgerow, 52 kilometers, 53 kilometers, uh, working on this community tree nursery capacity, getting together with all sorts of volunteers and trainees to, to uh, upskill them. Um, and as I said, there will be a whole range of university research going on to, to provide a, a really comprehensive review of the literature that exists. Um, all of that will be pulled together by March of next year. So I hope what you've taken from this evening's talk is that hedges are complicated structures. They are an important part of our landscape. They, they've been in our landscape for, for centuries, for millennia in some cases. Um, if we're going to have hedges managed properly going forward, we need to understand them, we need to celebrate them. We need to ensure that we manage them properly and we need to encourage the next generation of trees to grow within them. I know that some of you are involved in a whole range of tree management thoughts, processes, and the trade needs to think of hedges as, as trees. And I often think that we don't think of hedges as trees. So my closing shot to you is this. If we were live and I could talk to you, Oh, actually, you might be able to have a go. Um, uh, John, if you're there, uh, you'll be able to read out the answers to me if, if anybody gets, gets these. Um, can anybody tell me what that is? Not you, John. On the chat, can anybody tell me what that is? Got any takers? Nobody yet, but I've got faith, John. They'll be chipping in any second now. <clears throat> I'll give them 10 seconds, and if nobody gets it, I'll tell you what it is. Oh, we've got we've got one answer. Do you want me to read it out as it comes in? Yeah, go on. Yes, please, mate. Liz says hawthorn. Liz is dead right. That is a hawthorn. And the reason for showing it is that I don't think most people think of a hawthorn as a tree. A hedge is a collection of trees. It is just we are managing them as clipped boxes. Um, they can become 
like this glorious hawthorn up in Cumbria, fully mature trees if we manage them. The thing about hawthorns though, is that they are the ultimate tree in that you can manage them and shape them and do almost anything you like with them to create a landscape that is suitable for your needs. Um, and that is why we need to everybody to relate to our hedges, to start thinking about our hedges, to think about it as a tree management exercise that we are doing properly. And we need to engage with that so that we have a healthy, thriving hedgerow network across the country over the next um, 7,000 years. Uh, and so that we have more hedges, 40% more hedges by 2030, and that they're doing a useful purpose in our landscape. So thank you for listening. Um, we're going to questions now. If anybody's got any questions that they, we don't answer tonight, you can email us at hedgerows at treecouncil.org.uk. National Hedgerow Week is there on the, uh, the screen and I'm sure that um, Steve will pop that in the chat. Uh, and on behalf of the Tree Council, thank you for listening. And thank you, John, for inviting us to do this presentation this evening. Thank you very much, John. All very interesting stuff. Hedgerows really are just brilliant. I was in uh, sort of North Devon, Somerset, just a few weeks ago, and they've got some of the best hedgerows anywhere down there around Exmoor. It's awesome. Um, right, we've got quite a few questions coming in. Keep pinging your questions in. Let's do, let's do a serious one first. John, we're going to do a serious one first. I'm sure you'll be able to clarify this. Uh, an important point from Charles, uh, who said that woody species such as elder are included in Schedule 3 in the Hedgerow Regulations 1997. Grubbing them out or poisoning them and other invasive species could constitute a criminal offence. And Charles is just saying that in, in your talk, you talked about taking out invasive species, elder, sycamore and the like, and perhaps it's a bit more nuanced than just taking them out all the time. It is a, very much nuanced. Um, having had a hand in writing those regulations back in the 90s, um, getting it right was complicated. And Charles is, was it Charles? Uh, Ch Charles is dead right. Um, how you manage that going forward is, a, I like elder. It is a particularly desirable thing for me because it, it, it supports a wide range of wildlife. Uh, how that is done, uh, in a way that is environmentally sensitive and not illegal is, is complicated. Hedge layers hate it because they, it, it messes up the structure. It creates that. Um, and the point there that, that Charles is referring to is that on Nigel's point one of his score, he said, grab up the elder and poison it. Uh, that, that is what the hedge, that, that is what it says in the guidance. Um, but Charles is right. You've got to do that properly. You've got to do that sensibly. You've got to, you've got to do that in a way that doesn't constitute um, uh, a crime, uh, and therefore you've got to do it properly. Um, it's complicated. Thanks, John. Uh, I guess sort of let's extend that one a little bit. Here's a question from Peter, and obviously I know one of the reasons you'd be looking to take out things like elder or certainly sycamore might be this native non-native debate that we talk about an awful lot on our webinars and um peter's asked what non-native tree species are being investigated to improve resilience in future hedgerow stock in light of future pnd threats and climate change and when we're talking about urban trees we always say you really shouldn't be talking about the native non-native thing we need non-native trees in urban areas but what's the case in sort of more rural hedgerow situations it's a really, really good question that, that I genuinely don't know the answer to in terms of um, alternative non-native shrub type species that might work. There hasn't been a lot of research on it. So when I say I don't know, I don't know that anybody knows. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research on that topic. It is an area that opens up a whole range of, of interesting thoughts. Um, in urban areas, obviously, the, the palette can be greater. Uh, because you can have them in gardens and you can have them on street edges. Um, but as yet, that hasn't spread into the countryside thought process. Um, and it probably needs to, to maximise the, to maximize the, 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 the uh, resilience. So, for example, um, sycamore is, I mean, you can argue whether sycamore is a native or a non-native. Um, uh, if you listen to Ted Green, uh, sycamore is, is the Celtic maple. It's a native species that's just, just badly, um, uh, badly given press. Uh, but certainly from a hedge management point of view, what it does is it creates shade. Now that stops the hedge from growing underneath it. So the hedge layers don't like it because it creates shade. 
but as a tree, as an object within a hedge structure, if you're not so worried about the hedge underneath, it's a good, it's a good thing to have. Uh, alternatives that have been looked at, um, walnuts been looked at as a potential um, for, for hedgerow planting. All sorts of things are being looked at. Um, there isn't yet though a common list. And one of the things that I will take back to Hedgelink for because we have our next meeting next month is um, to try and answer that question. So we will try and give you an answer, but I don't have one at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, it's an interesting and, and complicated one, isn't it? Um, right, we've got quite a few questions coming in Thanks. now. Bumpty dumpty dum, what we go for. This is a nice one, I think, from Steve. Uh, uh, Steve is an amateur hedge layer and is wondering what ways uh, could we go about promoting the craft of hedge laying? We, we appreciate something that's kind of, I don't want to say dying out, but it's certainly not as common as it was. How can we go about restoring it in the public mind, maybe? So um, there is the, obviously the National Hedge Laying Society. Um, and uh, if you're not aware of it, then go and have a look at the National Hedge Laying Society, which is a, a, a fabulous group of experts who gather together and do you know, promote the act of hedge laying. Um, there is a national championships for hedge laying that's always worth seeing. Um, this year that will be in Hampshire in the autumn. Um, but he's right. There is still, um, I think it's, I can't remember what Nigel says, but I think it's about 1% of hedges across the country are laid. So it is a very small element of the, of the hedge management system is actually the hedge laying process. I guess in the end, the way that we will make it, um, that we will make it more common is that we will need to, to support the fund, the, the people to, to manage the hedges in that way, to use those traditional skills. Unfortunately, it is more expensive than many other hedge management systems. Um, but if we valued it, we would fund it. And with the redevelopment of the uh, ELM system, which is the basic payment system that's going to be there for paying farmers going forward for delivery of um, environmental land management services, which is what ELM stands for, then, then we, could fund, um, we could fund that. Um, we used to spend about £60 million pounds a year under the previous uh, hedgerow management, sorry, previous um, farm payment systems on managing hedges, but we paid farmers then to not cut their hedge. So we were actually paying them to do something negative. They were being paid to not cut a hedge until the third year. You know, it, if we spent that £60 million pounds on encouraging hedge laying, for example, um, we would probably have a, um, a better value for money but that's got to be part of the conversation that is going on over the next two or three years as that system is is developed and as the amateur hedge layer keep it up have a go do more of it promote it to your colleagues get everybody engaged in in hedge laying it's it's just good fun apart from anything else thanks john and you mentioned the uh, the hedge lane championships fritz has put a comment in saying that um uh in the in boxmere in the netherlands uh, they have unesco protected uh, hedges and every year we have the Dutch Hedge Laying Championship, uh, which is good for organisations to share experience and contacts. So I think we should all head out to the Netherlands for the next Dutch Hedge Laying Championship. So, so a lot of a lot of my colleagues already do, and we're we're heavily involved with the Dutch societies involved with Dutch Hedge Laying. Um, so, so you're right. There is uh, hedges are, are particularly British, um, but there are also hedges. Um, it's a particularly, you know, a strong part of the British landscape, but there are also hedges that are a strong part of the Normandy coast, um, of the sort of uh, Dutch areas and down into bits of Germany. Other than that, hedges aren't necessarily that common worldwide. Um, but the Dutch, the French, the Germans and ourselves all have a very strong shared interest in hedges. And I, I, it's genuinely worth going, John, to the, to the Dutch championships. Um, it's great fun. Oh, I wasn't joking. I'd go anywhere, John, anyway. And that sounds fantastic to me. We need very little excuse over here for a trip, particularly after 18 months of being, uh, of being stuck. <laughs> OK, we've got quite a few. Let's go for one a question from Jackie, who's up in Scotland. Uh, Jackie said, I note that a lot of the mature hedgerow trees along the sides of the roads up in Scotland are being cut back, heavily pruned, due to overhanging the road and interfering with utilities. Should we be looking at the final canopy spread when planting trees along roadsides or look at planting further back in order that we allow growth? 
Uh, yes and yes, Jackie. That I mean, the, one of the problems is that often the utility lines do run along the edges of the road. The trees that are growing underneath them and the fact that the hedges are becoming um, less managed, so they're becoming taller, is starting to put them up where the wires are, whereas historically they were managed a, at a shorter height. That is going to create greater problems going forward. And the way we manage that, the way we look at that, the way we deal with those issues is going to have to be part of the, of the conversation. The very worst case situation that we could have is that we lose all those hedgerow trees on those roadsides. Um, and so you're right, putting them back, putting them slightly further into the field, but then you lose a bit of agricultural land that might require us to pay the farmer to, to have a bit of, of take of the field so that we've, we've um, compensated them for the loss of the, of the agricultural productivity that can get off the field. All of those conversations are ones that need to be part of shaping the, the farm payment systems going forward. And some of the best hedges um, and best hedgerow trees are where you get a roadside hedge, a grass strip, and then a second hedge inside which you get your hedgerow trees growing. But that might, might require three, four metres, 10 metres, 30 metres of, of take, depending upon circumstances. But then you could have a footpath along the edges. And if we were created, creative, you could have a roadside hedge, a footpath, and then a second hedge with trees in it. That would require a massive mindset change in farmers on roadsides. Um, but if we're trying to reduce carbon, we're trying to get people out of their cars, providing them with those transport opportunities. Um, maybe there's, you know, it would be massive, but it would be highly desirable. Absolutely. Yeah, lots of possibilities there. Um, OK, here we are. Here's another one, maybe changing the mindset of farmers. Question from Anthony. Uh, Anthony saying, is there any scope for using three to five year cycle hedge cutting arisings to reinvigorate tree hay as an accepted component of animal feed? And we've had, again, through our webinars, some of our speakers, particularly I'm thinking Ted Green, Jill Butler, and many well, uh, very well esteemed speakers have been talking about getting tree hay back on the menu for our uh, livestock. What are your thoughts on that? So um, I've seen I've seen all of Ted's experiments and at, at places like NEP. Um, the animals do seem to love the, the 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 tree hay. So yes, you could use that arisings if you can get into a into a situation where they are used in a better way than just chipping them and chucking them into the bottom of the hedge. At the moment, what happens is they often get flailed, chipped. Uh, it lands in the bottom of the hedge. That increases the nutrients. Uh, that increases uh, things like uh, stinging nettles, which start to appear in the bottom of the hedge, that decreases the flora. So you actually don't want those arisings, those chippings going into the bottom of the hedge. Therefore, taking them off and using them for something like tree hay would be fantastic. Um, I don't know what the, the, the economic viability of that is, but it is certainly something that would make sense. The other thing that, that has been uh, and is being explored, and if you're from Normandy, uh, you know already that communities are using hedge arisings for, uh, for community heating systems so that you actually take the wood. And I think, I can't remember the exact figure, so I'll get this wrong. Uh, and if anybody knows better, please correct me. But I seem to remember it was something like five or six miles of hedgerow produced enough, um, uh, enough wood to heat a, a small to medium sized farm for a year if you managed your hedgerow properly and got your arisings uh, into your wood fuel system. So you start to become uh, a system that can, that can actually create wood that is being used in a proper way. And in Normandy uh, and in France generally, the, the hedge system was used to be known as Le Forêt de Paisin, the peasant's forest, because it gave everybody the opportunity to have a bit of woodland on your estate amongst your agricultural system. And therefore, it provided you with a wood fuel system. Uh, we don't think of our hedges as wood fuel, but perhaps we ought going forward, as long as well as um, uh, topics like like hay. Thanks, John. Yeah, good question there. Thanks, Anthony. Um, we got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you right at the end a little bit about ash dieback, if that's right. But before we get there, uh, one last question about hedges. Dan says. Is there merit in expanding the concept of the pine lines and the pine hedgerows 
that are so apparent in the Brecks and part of that historical landscape. Pine hedges. Don't get any of those around Gloucestershire. Tell me more. No, pine hedges are a beautiful part of, of as, as was said, of Breckland. Um, growing on that light sandy soil, it is a unique structural part where you have a created of pine. And yes, um, it would be fantastic to create more. Um, it's all about getting people to see that the hedge and the wood from the hedge and giving that hedgerow a purpose. Um, and in the end, if we are to have hedges going forward, they have to have a purpose, whether it be defining landscapes, whether it be culture, whether it be wood fuel or wood hay, um, uh, tree hay, they have to have a purpose in, in a modern day landscape. And we need to look at all those opportunities, both regional, national and, and local, to, to give hedges um, that value in the landscape. John, you said Devon hedges are some of the finest in the country. The Devon Hedge Group would tell you they are some of the finest in the world. Um, they say Devon's hedges are, you know, a globally important part of the landscape. Um, so we need to celebrate that and we need to celebrate that regional diversity. And, and um, East Anglian pine hedges are fabulous things, genuinely fabulous things. You've never seen them, go have a look. It is definitely worth seeing. Brilliant, one for the list, thank you very much. Um, okay, well, we had a uh, question. We just got uh, two or three minutes left. Um, and we had a question right at the beginning from Brian, who was asking uh, about ash dieback. So obviously, that those of you who don't know, the Tree Council and John have done an awful lot of work on, on ash dieback. And uh, Brian's asked, is there any evidence of resistance to ash dieback emerging in some ash trees? And just, I thought, just to expand that slightly, just for the last two minutes, John, I don't know if you would give us a sort of impromptu update on where are we with ash dieback? A lot of people are very interested always in our webinars. So ash dieback is, is happening, um, as obvious to everybody. It is complicated. There is no national recording system that tells us um, whether it's doing better or worse in one part of the country than another and so on and so forth. Uh, so therefore, all the evidence is anecdotal. But anecdotally, in the West Country, um, in Devon and Cornwall and Somerset, it is, it is doing particularly badly. But in the east of the country, in places like Kent, it is not apparently um, uh, being as impactful as we might have feared. And what we're starting to suspect is that this is about the weather and it's about the amount of fungi that are there to sporulate. So if it's particularly dry, um, as it might be in Kent, or it certainly is on some years in Kent, then the fungus is not sporulating as, as much. Um, but in the West where it's, where it's wetter, it's sporulating heavily. And so some of the county councils in the West are now um, are really struggling with the weight of work that they're doing. It's true in Wales, it's starting to become much more evident in Scotland that there are becoming problems. But in East Anglia, I was in East Anglia just this last month, and there were ash trees there that I was thinking, I was thinking, fantastic, they look, they look wonderful. So I don't know yet whether there's any evidence that there is resistance developing, but there is definitely in-year fluctuations happening um, about how good or bad the trees are looking, in, uh, and that seems to be down to the weather. I don't know that for an absolute scientific fact, but certainly on the basis of all the anecdotal information that we've got, that seems to be what's going on. Um, that makes it actually more complicated for tree managers because what we don't know is if what happens after a couple of dry years, if we get a wet year, whether it will then, a couple of wet years, whether it will then jump in and you might find that you've got some serious management. So um, planning is definitely part of the structure. Um, and if you've got hedgerow trees and those hedgerow trees are not threatening anything or anybody, you know, if they present no risk, then going forward, we need to be looking at those hedgerow trees as an important part of the conservation of ash. Um, because if they're slightly isolated, if there's not so many spores blowing around, if they've got that opportunity to, to survive because they're, they're distant, then hedgerow ash is going to be a really important part of the landscape. So if we can keep it, particularly in places like the east, um, and if it's not in fields that are going to present, you know, on edges of roads that might present you with some difficulty, then let's keep it. And I'm sorry that's not an easy answer, but ash dieback is not an easy subject. It's complicated. It's, we don't have enough information. In some places, it's worse than we thought this year. In other places, it's not as bad as we thought this year. Um, it's keep an eye, monitor your stock, 
manage when you need to, but only when you need to. Um, but manage the risky ones, you know, do it sensibly, do it properly, do it balanced. Um, and I don't know that any of them are yet resistant, but there might be. And every one that we keep standing has the opportunity to become that resistant one. So we need to just make sure we're doing it properly and sensibly, but balancing ecology with risk always. Absolutely. Thanks, John. So yeah, I think the message still don't remove it until you have, you have to remove it is still, I guess, the message we're all pushing. Interesting comment from Mike in the chat that we probably haven't got long enough to go into, but uh, Mike's just saying in Kent, it still looks very different in urban spaces as opposed to woodlands. And that's another interesting aspect of ash dieback, isn't it? The it extent is. to which is different in the urban environment to the rural. I don't know if you want to have any thoughts on that very quickly. Well, again, it's the same as the hedgerow trees. It's the amount of, it's the amount of you know, fungi that are there to sporulate. And if the leaves are blowing away, disappearing, being swept up by the by the grounds folk, you know, then the, the fungus is not there to sporulate. So that means the urban ones have that greater opportunity. You have to monitor, Mike and I have talked about this many times, you have to monitor, you have to look after, you have to uh, ensure that you're ready to be able to do the job if they start to decline rapidly. Um, but again, just do it in a balanced fashion. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. Well, I think that is all we have got time for. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for that, John. And thank you to the Tree Council, uh, not only for the presentation, but for the great work you're doing. And the the, uh, the Hedgerow project is really interesting and really valuable. Plus, I've also, in the last half hour, had invitations to hedge lane competitions in the Netherlands and the Pine Lines in Brex. So <laughs> I've had a good evening. Um, I'm, this is the selfish reason we do these webinars, really. So thank you for all you kind people out there. Um, thank you, John. Thanks to our audience. Thanks to Steve for uh, doing all the work behind the scenes tonight. And I hope that we will get to see many of you at six o'clock UK time uh, for our Wednesday webinar this week. Uh, and other than that, enjoy what's left of your weekend. Have a good week and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Good night.